Hello chemists, my name is Kim and today we are going to be talking about voltaic cells versus electrolytic cells in a little bit more detail. So I already made one video about electrochemical cells in general as an overview. And in this video, we are going to be looking at some simulations of electrolytic and voltaic cells and identifying on those simulations what is occurring where. Where's the cathode? Where's the anode? Where's oxidation? Where's reduction? What's, what's happening on this diagram or on this simulation? Um, we are also going to explain the purpose of various components of voltaic and electrolytic cells given a diagram and differentiate between voltaic and electrolytic cells in terms of energy input and output and other sort of regent style questions that we might see. So let's start with our simulations. I was really excited to find these simulations. They're free and online and open access to anyone who would like to view or use them. And I will make sure to put a link to the simulation in the uh, description for this video so that you can get to it. This is at javalab.org and we're looking at a chemical cell, voltaic cell, sometimes called a Daniel cell. And I am going to do some annotating here so we can think about what we are noticing on our simulation. So what I love about simulations is that they can show movement. Movement is important to be considering as we are looking at half reactions. So let's start by noticing just the direction that electrons are moving. And we've got two different examples here. These are both voltaic cells, just two different examples, and we'll think about the difference in a moment. So I see that the electrons are traveling this way. And I notice that I have what looks like a copper metal over here, and I have a zinc metal over here. Now this means that since I have my flow of electrons kind of mapped out, I can think about which side is showing me oxidation and which side is showing me reduction. So if electrons are leaving zinc, that means that oxidation would be occurring over at zinc, right? Oxidation, oil rig, oxidation is losing. So this is oxidation. And we've got oil rig as our first memory trick. We also have red cat and anox. So this would also be the anode is where my oxidation is taking place. Now over on the other side where copper is, I have electrons entering the metal. So this would be my reduction side or the cathode, red cat. So I've got zinc being oxidized, copper being reduced. And when we think about what's happening as the electrons travel through the wire, we see that there's signs of electrical energy being released. So I can see the electrical energy being converted into other forms of energy. And I can see signs of the energy transfer in the light. Over here on the other side, I have a similar cell, but now there's two separate solutions. And I see that there's this weird horseshoe ring kind of in between them. So when we see a ring like this, we call this a bridge between two solutions. This is what's known as a salt bridge in an electrochemical cell. A salt bridge is there to allow ions to travel between solutions, to allow the circuits to continue moving. Without a salt bridge, eventually the reaction could stop. We still have oxidation occurring at zinc, and we still have reduction occurring at copper. So my, my anode and my cathode are still the same sides over here. And in both of these situations, these reactions are occurring spontaneously. Zinc is being reduced, or is being oxidized, excuse me, and copper is being reduced without us having to do anything to the zinc or do anything to the copper to get that reaction to begin. We are taking advantage of the fact that electrons are flowing from the zinc to the copper to light this light bulb, to use some of that electrical energy from the moving electrons. Let's look instead at electroplating which involves a electrolytic cell. So I'm just gonna add over here, this is an example of an electrolytic cell. 
in my electrolytic cell, I am using batteries to induce this flow of electrons. This is not happening spontaneously. I need to use electrical energy to make this happen. And so what am I making happen? Well, by hooking up the batteries the way that they are adjusted, notice this positively charged end of the battery is hooked up to the metal that we would like to electroplate onto the fork. So we would like to electroplate silver onto this fork. And to do that, we need solid silver to become an ion in solution. We need the fork to become negatively charged so that the silver will go stick to it. So I have electrons leaving the silver because the battery is hooked in, the positive terminal of the battery is hooked into the silver. And the negative terminal of the battery pushes electrons away because negative charges repel other negative charges and forces them down into the fork where the positive ions in the solution will come and form a solid coating on the fork. Eventually, as we can see, as the silver ions come out of solution, they will form solid neutral silver atoms on the fork surface. So in order to have this whole process proceed, we need to oxidize the silver, right? Silver needs to be oxidized. And so this would be my anox red cat. This would be my anode. And the fork needs to be reduced. So this would be my cathode over here. Notice I'm not generating electricity here the way that I was in the voltaic cell. I'm using electricity to force the flow of electrons because they would not naturally go from the silver to the fork. We can assume the fork is maybe made of iron or another metal that would not allow this to occur spontaneously. In this particular example, there is silver nitrate as an ion in solution just so that there's extra silver ions in the solution. This is a little bit confusing. So let's think about what's happening in this particular reaction. So if I have electrolysis occurring, that means I am taking water, H2O, and I am splitting it into oxygen gas plus hydrogen gas, H2 plus O2. Pardon my computer drawing here. If I want to think about what's happening to the oxidation states of oxygen and hydrogen to really think about what's going on here, I can remember, okay, oxygen has one oxidation state. It's negative two. That means hydrogen must have an oxidation state of positive one when it is paired with oxygen and water. Both hydrogen and oxygen are ending up with oxidation states of zero because they are ending up as single elements. So that tells me that wherever reduction is taking place, that is going to be, hey, look, that's where hydrogen is going from its oxidized state plus one, it's a more positive state, to becoming neutral, zero. So this is where hydrogen, if I'm writing down the half reaction, this is where hydrogen with a charge of plus one is becoming, is gaining an electron to become neutral hydrogen. So this is where hydrogen with a charge of plus one is gaining an electron. This is my reduction side of the equation. Over here at the anode, where oxidation is occurring, I'm thinking about what's happening with oxygen. So I'm gonna just use the pencil tool here. I have neutral oxygen, and I've got two of my oxygens. Oftentimes we, when we're doing half reactions like this, I'm gonna put the two as a coefficient. So I've got two oxygens are being oxidized to become oxygen with a charge of two plus plus two electrons. And then I could go through and think about my balancing later on. But just as I'm thinking about how electrolysis as a process relates to an electrolytic cell, this is what's really going on there. Let's do a couple of practice problems. Which energy conversion during, occurs during the operation of an electrolytic cell? Read the options, think about your answer choice, and pause the video if you need more time.
So an electrolytic cell, remember, is a cell that requires electrical energy to get it started. That's how I like to remember it. Electrolytic requires electrical energy to start it. So electrical energy is needed to start the reaction and chemical energy is the energy conversion that the energy that is made. So the energy conversion is electrical energy in, chemical energy out. Let's try another question. At which electrode does oxidation occur in a voltaic cell and in an electrolytic cell? Does it occur, does oxidation occur in the anode in a voltaic cell and the cathode in an electrolytic cell or is it some other combination thereof? So read each of these options here. Pick which one you think is correct and pause the video if you need more time. The answer for this one is that the anode in both a voltaic cell and an electrolytic cell. Remember, red cat and ox, it works for both types of cells and it's pretty easy to remember. Just think of a red cat and an ox. You're probably gonna wanna pause the video here because this is a three-part question. An operating voltaic cell has zinc and iron electrodes. The cell and the unbalanced ionic equation representing the reaction that occurs in the cell are shown below. Identify the subatomic particles that flow through as the cell operates. Identify in terms of zinc atoms and zinc ions why the mass of the zinc electrode decreases as the cell operates. And state the purpose of the salt bridge in the cell. So pause the video and think about it. So first, the subatomic particle that flows through as the cell operates, that should be Electrons, right? Electrons flow through the cell. That's what's going through the wire. That's how redox reactions occur, the transfer of electrons. Explain in terms of zinc atoms and zinc ions why the mass of the zinc electrode decreases as the cell operates. This is a little bit subtle, but zinc atoms are not soluble in water. They are solid. Notice the, the sign solid. While zinc ions are soluble. Notice AQ for aqueous. So the mass of solid zinc electrode decreases because as the reaction goes on, solid zinc atoms are becoming zinc ions. And finally, state the purpose of the salt bridge in this cell. As I discussed in the simulation we were looking at before, the salt bridge allows ions in the solution to move back and forth. It just prevents there from being too much charge in any one solution and allows charges to keep moving through the circuit. Awesome job today. Let's check back in on our learning goals and just remind ourselves of what we started out wanting to do in this video. Electrochemistry can seem like it's a lot of different ideas brought together. That's why it's often taught later in the school year in a chemistry class, because we're bringing together parts of different aspects of this class that you've learned. Ions and solubility and chemical reactions. We're putting it all together. So you should feel really proud of yourself having gotten to this topic and kind of beginning to put together the pieces of how chemistry can power the world around us because batteries are going to be super important as we think about ways to combat climate change and save energy. Awesome job today.